Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you, uh, even though I can't see you. Um, on behalf of the, the uh, staff of the Teaching and Learning Center, I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's faculty plenary at the Teach at CUNY Summer Institute. Um, these sessions are designed, these plenary sessions are designed to give the Institute a, a common set of guiding questions that in the past have resonated throughout the workshops, through the seminars, throughout the hallways as we've chatted about the Institute. Um, and as a staff, we want to kind of acknowledge right out that it's been difficult for us to have a firm sense of that commonality because of everything that's been happening, um, because it's hard for us to see you. Um, but we do hope over time that that sense um, does develop and that it grows stronger. Um, we hope that the common experience of annotating our, our Teach at CUNY handbook, which has been very exciting for all of us to watch and to reflect upon with you all in seminar and in our conversations as a staff member, that that experience has generated a sense of collective movement, not only within the seminar groups, um, but across them as well throughout the Institute. Uh, and um, we, we hope that this plenary session um, and next week's um, featuring conversations with CUNY undergraduates um, will accentuate that sense of commonality. Before introducing our, our, uh, our uh, panelists, uh, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, another element of the Institute that we'll be launching later uh, this week, and those are the TLC chats. These are uh, informal opportunities um, for folks to have um, less structured conversations around some of the ideas that have been surfacing in our conversations as a, as a staff and, and uh, in our reflections on the seminar. The topics that we are proposing are um, building community, right? The opportunities to, that uh, exist and the challenges around building community across um, disciplines within our teaching. Teaching online and the challenges of asynchronous engagement in, in online uh, instruction. Teaching synchronously online and how you navigate digital spaces. The questions of assessment um, during a pandemic, uncertainty and amidst political unrest. Um, how to balance assignments, activities, and assessments in online courses. Navigating your campus. We want to acknowledge that although there are, are uh, many similarities between CUNY campuses, CUNY campuses are also distinct, uh, and having under, an understanding of that can really help you in your first semester's teaching uh, at CUNY. Um, and then we'd also like to offer, an, offer up an opportunity for a Zoom happy hour, just to have a drink together uh, and to talk about uh, whatever you want to talk about. So these uh, TLC chats um, are listed in more detail and described um, at cuny.is, cuny is slash TLC dash chats. Um, and I believe one of the TLC uh, staff members will be uh, posting that into the chat space for the Zoom and also onto the Institute Slack channel. So you'll, you can go to that page, you can read about these uh, chat opportunities and then you can go to a Google form and indicate which chat opportunity you'd be most interested in. Um, we're not gonna do all of them. We'll probably do the, the uh, top three or four requested chats. Um, we'll leave that voting open today and tomorrow and then announce what the chats will be on Wednesday, okay? Um, so uh, one more bit before uh, welcoming our panelists, I just want to orient you to this webinar space, um, which I'll confess is our, my first time using it. Um, so uh, forgive us if there are any hiccups along the way. Um, but there's two spaces for attendees um, to interact um, via text. One is in the chat window, which you should be able to access um, by uh, clicking on chat at the bottom of your screen. And I can see that's already an active space. Um, and this is just for uh, reflecting, taking notes, um, having a back channel uh, conversation uh, about what you're hearing from the panelists. And then we have a Q&A section, which is an, uh, an area to post questions specifically for our panelists today. Um, and we'll make sure we reserve plenty of time at the end of the session um, for, for them to work through these questions. So chat for less formal kind of reflective dialogue and back channeling around the, the plenary session, and then Q&A specifically for questions for our panelists. So as a, a teaching and learning center director, one of the best parts of my job is that I get to talk with CUNY faculty members about their teaching um, and, uh, and graduate center students, obviously, about their teaching. And to hear uh, the range of ways that folks 
reflect upon their experiences, the way, range of ways that they enact their commitment to what happens in, in CUNY undergraduate classrooms is always invigorating, exciting, stimulating, um, intellectually challenging and rewarding. Um, and um, I'm fortunate to have uh, on the panel today with me um, four teachers who I've had these conversations with uh, over time uh, at CUNY and I'm, I'm always impressed with their reflectiveness, um, their creativity uh, in their classrooms uh, and really uh, honored to have them with us uh, and think we'll learn a lot from hearing them reflect upon their experiences teaching at CUNY today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Cheryl Smith. Cheryl, if you can just wave. Um, Cheryl Smith is an associate professor of English uh, at Baruch College, where she teaches literature and writing. Uh, and she's also uh, the co-editor of the Journal of, Basic, uh, B Journal of Basic Writing. She serves as the faculty liaison to the Center for Teaching and Learning at Baruch. Um, and she leads faculty writing retreats and other faculty development events. Peter Gregory is an associate professor of mathematics at Baruch and has been teaching math uh, at Baruch since 2001. Shauna Brandel is another proud Graduate Center grad, uh, an associate professor of political science at Kingsborough Community College, where she also works on open educational resources. You wave, Shauna. That's Shauna. And Rhea Banerjee is an assistant professor of English at Gutman Community College, uh, where she also serves as the program coordinator of the second year liberal arts program. By night, she's a scholar of literary modernism is an at work, and is at work on her first book. And she is also an alum of the Graduate Center. Welcome, Ria. So we'll, we'll start with Cheryl. Um, and Cheryl, I'd, I'd like to ask you um, to tell us a bit about how you plan and design a new course. What does that process look like for you? And, and can you walk us through it? Okay. Um, well, I, if it's a brand new course for me, I like to see models. So the, and even really, if it's not a brand new course, say I'm, oh, I'm retooling a course that I, I've taught before, but maybe haven't taught in a while. I like to see models. And so, you know, I will ask colleagues, but even more importantly, I just go online and Google the course and I try to find models online, you know, from other institutions. I try to, to be as broad as possible. And I just start flagging the elements that I like um, in terms of content, possible uh, readings or, or that I might want to, you know, poach or, or use or check out because I don't know them and they sound interesting. So I just start doing research that way. Um, and then when I'm really getting down into the process of designing my own course, I like to, I tend to teach courses in modules of three, so three units. It doesn't have to be as clean as units, but I tend to think of it in thirds. So um, I, I start by, it's kind of a backward design model. Where do I want students to end up? What's the last thing I wanna be doing in the course? And then I design backward from there, and I might, it might not be quite as neat as literally backward, but I start thinking in the units, what's kind of the capstone of each unit, what's the end point for each unit, and design back from there. Um, what are the big questions I know I want to thread throughout the three units, what's going to be discrete to each individual sort of module or section of the course. So I design it by three, in three sections, and I tend to think what are the outcomes, the overall outcome for the course, the big questions that I want to be able to answer, the kinds of activities or projects I want students working on, um, and then how do I build across those three units? So I sort of do a, that sort of a kind of a backward design and I start with what are the, the kind of the outcomes, both in terms of what kinds of questions I want the class to be able to engage in, what sort of projects I want students to be doing, and um, you know, what sorts of skills do I want to be building along the way? Thank you for that, Cheryl. Peter. <laughs> Same question, right? Yes. So, uh, like Cheryl, I too uh, plan a course or create a course with the end in mind, like what where I want my students to be when they're when they've completed the course, knowing what what course they're they're going to have to take after my course. Or basically, I'm right now. I'm thinking about just 
designing these new calculus courses with the end in my online calculus courses with the end in mind, knowing that they're going to have to take, say, a probability course in the end or another a subsequent calculus course or something like that. So I think of the, 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 the big ideas in each section of calculus and uh, kind of come up with uh, activities, um, kind of very short qu quizzes that get at the go goals ideas that that they need to get to the next idea in math like and you know math is kind of special in a way that it's this kind of cum accumulation of knowledge you need prior stuff to get step by step to the bigger questions and we're always calling on previous knowledge to uh to motivate subsequent learning so that's that's basically how i plan uh a new a new course also i try and plan the new course with students uh i don't know student satisfaction and in, and engagement in mind like i want the students to be to feel like when, once they finish the course they've they've learned something and that they're going to be able to apply this this course in either, either a future course or be able to uh do well or pass the summative assessment that they're going to be required to take and so a specific example i teach a lot of actuarial science courses uh the society of actuaries has a lot of these professional exams that students need to take so i would like the student to complete the co be able to take this course and when they're done feel like i've they've acquired enough knowledge and skill to be able to perform well on these exams that they're going to need to take in the future that's Peter, can I ask you to, to say a little bit more about that student satisfaction piece? You've indicated a kind of a professional um, element or requirement that you're orienting them towards. Are there other ways right. where you can kind of extract from them their, their, their sense of satisfaction or, or help them even understand what it means to be satisfied by the course? Well, what I think what I really mean by that is when they, even with it, it it's almost uh, lesson the lecture to lecture or whatever not not like that's the format but you know class to class they leave class feeling like something's been accomplished and that they're able to leave class and complete assignments and things like that and an un, it, it would be I feel like the, I would be unsatisfied as a student to attend a class uh, have an opportunity to ask questions and you know meet with your fellow students and your instructor, do a bunch of problems and then leave class and think, oh, I, I can't do these, I don't know how to do these now that I'm not in class anymore. So that would be unsatisfying. So I'd like them to, to you know, feel like they can be successful outside of the classroom environment. And a lot of times you have students who say, oh, when, when we were doing it in class, I, could, I totally understood it, but then I went home and I couldn't do it, I was totally stuck. So I try and plan each lesson in a way that they can leave the classroom or the classroom setting uh, and be successful in doing a homework or, or some sort of online project and not feel like there's a, like they can't, so. Thank you. Um, can I, I just add? Yes, Sorry. please, please. I just wanted to add something about that because it's such a great point that Peter made about student satisfaction. And I forgot to mention um, sort of a benefit for me of thinking in the three units for my course is that I give them the whole, I give students at the beginning of the semester the whole syllabus and uh, in terms of the architecture of the course, what's going to be expected of them and rough due dates, although those are flexible often. But um, I only give them the first, the schedule of the first unit or the first third and then I mean you can always use student feedback from your previous courses in terms of student um, you know the, the review the peer the reviews the evaluations they do at the end of the semester but I tend to give little surveys at the toward the end of each unit um, so I gauge where students are what they seem to be most interested in and then I ask them to fill you know to answer some questions and I use that to, to retool the uh, second and third parts of the course how are things going are certain things taking longer than I thought? So then I might pull off some of the things that I was going to do. Um, what are students enjoying? What's working? What's not working? You know, every group of students is different. So 
I like to be able to do that. Um, and I never, I almost, I never release the whole uh, schedule for the semester at the beginning of the semester anymore. Because I just was always changing it. I think it's a really good point, Peter. Thank you for that. And um, before handing it over to Sean, I just want to draw the attendees attention into um, how Cheryl and Peter are both thinking at the level of the course as, as uh, you know, a uh, experience that has an arc at the level of the unit as an arc within that larger arc and at the level of the individual class and even within the level of the individual class, the individual activity of the class and a lot of work. And also, I think they're both thinking across semesters and across classes, right? And our thinking this week in the Institute is about these points of entry, entry for conceptualizing your courses and articulating learning goals that uh, are at the level of the course or at the level of the unit, at the level of the day and at the level of the assignment. Um, and I think you'll see, um, and, and Shauna and, and, and Rhea will uh, add further, um, will further exemplify this, right? That experienced teachers really can, can think about what's happening in their classes across all these levels and how they're connected. Shauna, can you tell us about how you design a new course? So I almost never design a new course. Um, I teach in a community college. I teach American government, uh, intro, you know, POL 51 from now until I retire, uh, if things go well. Uh, and then I, every once, once a year, I get to teach intro to IR. So what I, I don't really design new courses, but I tweak them constantly. So I really want to echo what Cheryl said about finding other examples. I, you know, Twitter has been a really good resource for me, plugging into my professional association, um, the teaching and learning section there, uh, and just other colleagues around CUNY to find out what, who's doing something cool. Like, that sounds fun. I want to do that. Or if I'm having a problem with something, it's not going as well as I want, finding other models, examples to plug in. Um, I started on the cutting edge of 2005. I've started blogging. Um, to sort of keep track of what I'm doing and, and to more formally track my, what I'm trying for so I can go back and look at it. Um, and that's been really helpful. I also, uh, I took a course that, that, had, that asked uh, what your course map for the semester was to so draw it out. And then I thought that was so interesting. That's now the first slide on the first day of all of my classes. I was like, this is what I think we're gonna cover. Um, this is what I want you to get out of it at the end. Um, but also, I've really come around in the last couple of years to thinking about intrinsic motivation, like student motivation. What I want them to get out of it is not that important because if they don't want to get that out of it, who am I to tell them that they should get that out of this class? So what they want to get out of the class. So I, I say, what is your, what are your goals? And I've been trying to think of different ways to focus in on that to make this real. So teaching American government is really real for students in a way that it takes a little while for them to see, but the U.S. government can, in ordinary times, forget extraordinary or extrajudicial ways, uh, you know, violate your, your property, your, your life, all of these different things. So it's really, really important, um, but most students just take it because it's a required class, and I, I have to confess to them that I never actually took it because I didn't have to. Um, I went to a weird undergrad program, so, uh, but in answer to that, thinking about, and, and then also I really want to echo what Sherilyn Peter said about thinking where this and models are helpful, so figuring out what your class, if you have a class that feeds into another class, if you get an example syllabus just to see how that's done at your institution, thinking about, and this is really hard to ask of students who are teaching, because you all have your coursework and your research to attend to, but thinking about if you're gonna design a course, um, trying to adapt one at least in your first semester, and then make tweaks gradually, uh, because you need to, you know, if you completely overhaul, you spend your whole summer overhauling the course to really, but it doesn't fit your institution that you, you end up dropping something that they actually need. You're gonna create problems for your students, you're gonna create problems for yourselves, uh, for yourself and it's gonna suck up all your time. So sometimes doing less and then also my other Evolution has been more and more to switch things to student work So what are they doing and giving them choice in that work? So that's that's been the emphasis of my experiments lately 
Thank you, Shauna. Ria. Hi, friends. Um, Luke, I wonder if it's okay. I, I wrote up a couple of uh, notes to myself because uh, a few things happen on our campus. Uh, I work at Gutman Community College um, and uh, our students kind of made a very strong petition um, mid last week and so I typed up a couple of things and so I just want to say to the audience that's here that I'm happy to be speaking to you guys although I think it's very strange to say the word happy uh, recently uh, you know the first TLC plenary was uh, canceled for exactly this reason right that um, when we say happy we don't exactly mean just happy we mean like a very complex sort of blend of emotions I am excited for the work that you guys are all going to be doing um, and, uh, and with the writer that I do think that things like the pandemic and things like police brutality against black lives is not gonna go away. And that these will be part of your classroom experience. And so um, I'll say for myself that I started as a, fairly, as a person who was privately political. And um, I found that over the course of my, uh, well, I've been at Gutman for six years and I've been teaching, this is the end of my 13th year. So it was a bit like, I don't know how to feel about this semester. Um, but I think that for me, something that has been sort of helpful from the very first m minute you step into class, and actually even before that, as you're de uh, designing a syllabus, is to be easily indexed and to be explicit. And I hear Cheryl and Shauna and Peter saying very much similar things. But um, I want to say, I want to sort of emphasize something that they've been saying. Um, and and to add my sense that we need to make our make explicit our sort of more complex emotional and intellectual selves in a way that is useful for our audience of students right so in other words a student cannot learn from me without trusting me and how can i um, portray a certain aspect of my personality it, my full personality doesn't need to be in the classroom but how can i portray myself clearly enough that a, a person who is a stranger can actually uh, trust me enough to learn from me um and so uh sort of going into the three i have three things cheryl your thing about the rule of three is really just like uh i completely am a rule of three sort of nerd i think that's i don't know what maybe it's a little uh, overused but I think it works well um, so just like uh, the others have been saying when I'm starting to prep a class I have this huge like I, I use Evernote a lot because it goes across platforms so I have just an Evernote page where I'm just making lists of everything we're doing so like like Shauna I also teach at a community college we don't always get to reinvent uh, to invent a course, but like a capstone class or something um, like I'm teaching a capstone on climate change and my Evernote page is like three pages long. It's just some chaos and madness. So really the place to start is to look at the course learning outcomes and just like I think Peter you mentioned this for math, but I think it's equally important for any of us teaching in any of our disciplines to think about where the student needs to be after the course is finished, right? So you can ask for very simple uh, details from your department. Again, I think Shauna mentioned this, that it's a burden on you, so be mindful of your time. But what are simple things that you can ask your department? You can ask them what students usually take right after your class, right? You can ask them if your course has any prereqs so that you can be, you can kind of build on something that students are bringing with them and you can send a student off uh, knowing that you have prepared them for the next stage in their sort of learning. And I think that is especially important for uh, community college uh, instruction because whatever my politics are and however I think about the educational industrial complex, honestly, that is less important than what my students want out of this class and they want to get out of my comp one so they can do well in comp two, right? I may not believe in grades, but if I decide not to grade my comp two in the sort of, some sort of way that's in between the standard way that I don't like and the way that I do like, if I don't give out that kind of assessment in a routine way, well, a student is gonna go into an English course at like Lehman and then flunk and then hate me, right? So I do need to be mindful of um, how, of the middle ground between what what I want, how I want to instruct, and what is the purpose of the instruction, which is typically the student moving forward, right? Um, the second thing is that, just like I think Cheryl mentioned it, so I won't kind of uh, reiterate, I like to isolate two or three skills or questions. I think more than two or three of 
a skill or a or sort of a bigger question, a thematic question, is too much for a class. You know, you can do three really well. If you have five or six, then I think it gets too much for a single class. Especially, I hope people won't mind, but I think there is a steep learning curve with pedagogy. And especially in the first semester or the first year or even the first two years, I would echo what Shauna said. You know, make life simple for yourself. You have coursework to do, you have research to do, and you have teaching to do. I don't think adjuncts are well compensated. And so I think that it, uh, a, a, a good plan that works well is worth considering for yourselves. But the third thing I wanted to point out is related to this is like is scope creep, right? And I saw the word scope pop up in the chat and I was like, man, be careful of scope creep because I think well, I'll say for myself that when I started teaching, I wanted to be that like transformational instructor, right? I wanted my course, like it was gonna be, it's comp one, but so what? They're all gonna become like, oh my God, this is gonna change their lives. But really, if I'm being brutally honest, a course is a course on the way to getting 120 credits to finish the degree, right? My course needs to fit not only the most impassioned and like well-prepared of my students or the ones who really need to hear me and that day speak about that, whatever, but it also needs to fit that student who just wants to get a C and pass the class, right? And I think it's completely legitimate for a student to not want to get an A in the course, even when they're capable of it. And um, are you as an instructor for the course offering enough ways for such a student to still learn from you, right? And I can always say more about this. Some of my other comments are sort of reiterating back to this, but I just want us to keep that C student in mind. A student who is a, getting a C, not because they cannot do better, but because they choose that in the course. Thank you so much, Ria. If I can follow up with, with one question, um, we, we've talked a lot uh, in, in my seminar and, and some of the others as well about how you define scope for a class. What is the appropriate amount of, of work um, to ask of students? Um, we'll, we'll talk specifically about that question in our current context. But overall, if you can give us an example of uh, a specific theme or a specific skill that you've, you've uh, identified uh, to work on with, with your students in the context of a semester. That would be helpful. Um, I think like in most of us, we have lots of examples. And uh, the one that I can think of right off the top of my head is uh, most recently, I, I, it's a, the, I'm teaching, a, I designed a climate change capstone. And at the beginning of this, and I, and I wanted to do it because I think it's important. I can't believe we aren't thinking climate change constantly all the time, right? Um, uh, but, and this was a six week course though. And in a six week capstone course, even if these are well-prepared Gutman students who are going on to four year colleges, even if they are prepared for academic load and they've chosen to take this shorter semester course, there's only a certain amount of uh, reading that they can do and writing they can do, right? Um, so, like uh, uh, our capstones at Gutman are writing intensive, which roughly, I believe in CUNY, translates to about 15 pages of informal work and 15 pages of formal work. It doesn't really, writing intensive doesn't really mean you write a lot. It just means that you scaffold your assignments and you revise work and things are built like in components that then come together and the focus is on refining what students are writing rather than on producing tons and tons of content of fresh writing every time. And so um, thinking about, you know, in a capstone class, I would love to have a research project that like some sort of like huge 10 page research paper is like my nerdy ideal. But really, um, I, I wanted to focus down in, in terms of the scope creep, right? To, to stop my ambitions from getting in the way of my pedagogy, actually. Um, I decided there's three things that I wanted students to get out of the class, right? One is um, like the, the focus was climate change, but I wanted to ask about students to think creatively about what would come after these issues that science is pointing us to. So I didn't want us to stay in a place of sort of dismay where it's like, oh my God, New York will drown and I'm from Calcutta and Calcutta's gonna drown and Bangladesh will be over flooded. Like, what will we do? That's not a very helpful place for me. So I wanted students to think about what could be creatively and what could be specifically. So the, you know, the creative assignment was something like, imagine a human of tomorrow. And they could like imagine whatever they wanted. You know, they came up with some crazy ideas, you know, people with gills, people who didn't sweat anymore, people who didn't need to eat. 
it doesn't matter really what crazy thing they imagined because they had to explain how that tied in with the changes in the world that climate change would bring. Um, and but you see that this ima this imaginary assignment, which is uh, not academic in that traditional way that I was taught to think of academic work. It's kind of more creative. It's a little bit funky. Um, but I think that it, it required academic critical thinking. And so that's been an example of scope creep, right? Because my brain immediately goes to like a paper or some sort of like evidence of thought. But there might be other ways to get that same evidence of critical thinking and, um, you know, the, 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 the Bloom's taxonomy, the revised taxonomy, to get to like analysis and creativity, uh, there might be shorter ways to do that than a, a traditional assignment. Thank you. Um, and just a, a parenthetical note um, for uh, attendees, approximately 70% of students at CUNY senior colleges started at CUNY community colleges, right? So the students that Shauna and Rhea are teaching at Kingsboro and Gutman um, will end up in your classes and Cheryl's classes and Peter's classes, right? So there's, um, it's a big university and there's lots of movement uh, uh, within our campuses and between them. Um, if we go back to Cheryl um, and uh, Cheryl, can you tell us um, what you know now that you wish you had known when you began your teaching career? Okay. Um... I had thought of three things, although <clears throat> I'm going to add a fourth based on something that Rhea just said that she made me think of. But one is, um, you know, you can be flexible. Uh, you can have it written in the syllabus that you're going to do A, B, and C, and you can do A and B only, or just A, or start with A and realize this is, you can be flexible. You can change plans midstream. And often I have to do that because you know, it's a good thing to do because something's going well and students just need more time to process it and work on it. We all need more time. I can shift deadlines. I can shift, you know, when we're finishing a certain reading that we're doing together because it needs more time. So you can be flexible and, and along with that, less is more. Absolutely less is more. It's a scope question. I think that Rhea brought up, it's a really important one. And when I've worked with um, new teachers, I used to dir um, direct the Great Works of World Literature program, which is sort of a required sophomore level um, literature, gen ed literature course at my college. A lot of students take it. And when I was working with new instructors in that, I would almost 100% of the time, maybe a little less, but I feel like it's 100% of the time I would encourage them to cut back on readings and on expectations. Just spend more time with, what, with less, less is more. Um, I think re when it comes to reading for English classes, reading and writing classes, <clears throat> I've come to realize that students need more support with reading than I, than I would have known at the beginning. So I wish I had known that. I wish I had realized that students um, were not, not reading because they were just not compliant. They were not not reading because they were giving up, right? So they need, they, they think they don't understand it. They think it's beyond them. Um, I don't know how many times all of us have read something and had to reread it, not understood it the first time through. I'm still, I still read that way. I've been reading that way all my life. You know, I, I miss things. I, I misunderstand things. I don't get it. I, I zone out. Um, so students don't realize that that's a normal part of reading, that we're, we have to read recursively. And students need support, I think, with their reading. You know, they're not coming to college as... Um, expert readers, right? They're going to struggle with reading. They're going to be challenged with new levels of reading and they need support with reading. Absolutely. They give up. They need support with persistence. Um, and that ties back to less is more. Um, I came to realize, I mean, this, I don't, I, I'm not contradicting something Rhea said about grades, but I real, I wish I had known that I don't have to grade everything. I don't have to grade everything. Yes, they have to Great at the end of the semester that are standards that that are um, that can be you know ex experienced in some way as universal. I mean, every instructor is going to grade differently, but I don't have to grade every piece of writing, even if it's a formal paper. I can just give feedback, have a conference with them. It's so much more valuable um, than the letter grade, which may you know might not be um, a motivating factor for students, right? So if they feel like they're disappointed in the, what the letter grade is. It can, it can hold them back. So I really have 
a whole new relationship with grading over the years and I give points or I get, you know, just for handing it in on time and meeting basic, you know, you, you participated in peer review, you met a certain, you know, you didn't just hand me in five lines when I asked for a draft of a full draft of an essay, you know, they, I give them some basic standards that we agree upon as a course, you know, I negotiate assessment with students. I meet with them and talk to them. I never leave them in the dark. By the middle of the semester, they know roughly where they are in terms of a grade, where they're headed. Um, and I tell them to their face what their grade is and why. And we talk about it. Um, and I ask them what they think they're earning in the course. You know, so it's a more of a negotiation and it's less of grading as sort of the, 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 um, the maestro coming down and assessing your work. And I just, in, in, especially in writing classes, I don't think it's particularly motivating and it has the back now so and if you feel like this student has plagiarized but you know that and that hurts your feelings and I often take it personally um, I just have to remind myself that there are more forces at work than how the student feels about me it's not about disrespecting me or my course um, and I, I just think that Compassion is an important part of teaching and it can be hard because you pour so much into your course and you want students to rise to the occasion as you imagine them doing that. Um, you want to be transformational and, and you, you know, you want, you have these high um, hopes and expectations and sometimes um, students will disappoint those, those ideals that you have in your mind or they won't be reflecting them and you know so where are they coming from and why and why are they not engaging and don't take it personally it's not about you it's it can be a whole host of things right so I just think we need to sometimes take a breath and um, our students you know trying to get one over on me maybe who cares <laughs> you know so let me just extend an olive branch I want to keep them engaged in the course in some way so I do think that you know I often try to um, channel my my most sort of don't take this personally, which I have a tendency to do. Uh, don't take it personally. Just how can I be compassionate with this student and work with them um, in the most effective way for that particular student right now? Thank you, Cheryl, um, sure. for those comments and for your generosity as well. Um, Peter, what do you know now that you wish you wish you had known when you started teaching? Well, I started teaching as a high school and middle school teacher before I came to college. And uh, I had told uh, my colleague who was who had been a high school teacher for many years uh, that I was plan what my plans were. And uh, she said, well, you don't really need to do that to teach high school. And somehow I took that as an implication, like college students learn differently than high school students. And that wasn't true. And I did, I went, I started teaching college as an adjunct and I kind of uh, projected my idea of how college students should learn from my experience as a college student. Like I'll come in with my lecture notes, and I'll deliver this perfect mathematical lecture, with all the details, lots of writing on the board, and that uh, I quickly learned that that was <laughs> the, the exact wrong thing to do. I should have kept the same, the kind of kind of free flowing uh, atmosphere that I, or environment that I that was just kind of there in my high school classes, which were a little bit more raucous than what I experienced as an undergrad myself. There was lots of talking, and I even had some observations. Uh, recently not well not so recently but in my college days oh well there's a lot of talking going on and i said but as long as they're talking about math and they're not uh talking about other stuff it's it's i don't mind that i really don't mind the chatter um so that's one thing and uh the 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 other thing i 
which I knew then too, was that uh, learning, no matter the subject, is social. And it's important to in, in the class to, to get students working with one another and you know you then you're the instructor milling around working with everybody and and uh, developing like these little little working groups together and seeing that we're all in this together and we can help each other out and students can identify students that they kind of get and uh, they can work together and uh, do stuff together so and I've started to or I've really tried to emphasize that in my current classes that we've got to we're all in this together and uh, I also, uh, another thing, which is kind of along the lines of like, well, these college students are very sophisticated, is I, I, I wish that I had, was more comfortable, or even encouraged to kind of build in remediation into each course. Because just like you said, Cheryl, you know, the, the reading, you know, you have to be a careful reader and, you know, just the same thing in math, like they don't know there's, you know, adding fractions is not, you know, it's, you can't take it for granted. Divide, you know, long division, these things that you don't do every day. A lot of math you don't do every day. And so you have to build in factoring into these, these courses where you think, ah, oh, you know, you know factoring. And a lot, most of what I've learned over years is that students don't, don't come in necessarily knowing all that stuff or being comfortable with it. Because math is, I, I think, kind of, students find it intimidating. A lot of people have had bad math experiences in their previous uh, educational careers, whether it be high school, middle school, or, or college. And uh, they come in with a certain fear of the, the, the subject matter and a kind of a non-growth mindset. Like, oh, I can't do this. My father couldn't do math. You know, my parent, yeah. No, I just can't do math and things like that. So it's important to get them like, oh, you can do math here. We're going to go back and look at the stuff that and I'm not going to tell you that you should know it or like, how can you not know this? I kind of just build it in like here, this little, we have to, we'll have, we'll work through this detail here. And, and that's why also I like the, the kind of this move to online for math, I think has been I, helpful in that we're, able to allow the students access to these techno these technologies that exist that can help them out and help them not get bogged down in these little like i don't know how to add a third plus a one third plus one fourth you know okay like let's not that's not the big idea the big idea is you know the rates of change and you know things like that and now you have these websites like desmos.com where you can look at a graph it's just easy you type it in it's this you don't need you don't need these things and we just expect them to and now we can and we kind of encourage them to go to these websites or use this technology to help them get over that hurdle that algebra hurdle that always seemed to get them get them stuck so that's that's uh something that i like i wish i I wish that was something that we could have always turned to and I'm happy to do that and get to the big picture more than, you know, losing the forest for the trees. Uh, a th four, I, I wanted to keep things to three, but uh, I do agree and I've only learned this recently with the move to online, the importance of feedback, like really good feedback to students in writing or so lots of times I would hand back assessments to students with a little, you know, little comment. But now when I've been grading their PDFs online, they, like paragraphs of like, and this problem here, you blah, 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 let's talk about this. And the encouragement to meet, encouraging uh, us to meet with students via this, you know, platform, Zoom, and just talk about their work is, is really important. And the last thing I'll say is I totally agree with Cheryl and the need for compassion for students, especially in a, a math classroom where they're, they could come in intimidated already. I think it's so important that, you know, we share that, that we understand that their position and how we're there to, to help. And we're not there, not out to get them at all. We're there to encourage them and help them be successful in whatever their, their goals are. Thank you, Peter.
Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things you said and, and shift gears um, to Shauna and Rhea to our current moment. Um, and specifically to ask you how you've managed the transition to distance, distance education this semester and what are your thoughts about next year? And we've, we've heard about the need for flexibility, um, the need for, um, for compassion and for, for accessibility. We've heard Peter talked about uh, learning as a social act. All of these um, challenges um, always exist in our teaching and they're particularly troubled now. Um, so if you can just speak a little bit about how you've managed it this semester and projecting forward, how you're preparing yourself for next year. We'll start with, with Shauna and then go to Rhea. Um, I'm glad because this, uh, the last question and this question actually have the same answer to both. So I can sort of, um, I would have said to the last question that I don't have to teach how I was taught, which is really good because I can't teach this semester how I was taught. Um, so I, you know, this idea, if you've given a lecture via Zoom, you can do it, but it's not um, as effective for students, right? It's sort of in the same way for most of us, it's not going to be as effective, you know, just talking at students. That's a bad view. Make a video, right? And about student access, particularly this semester, because we had um, LaGuardia, uh, LaGuardia and Kingsborough are on a late semester. We do a 12 week semester. So we had two weeks of classes before the switch. So we barely knew anyone. Oh, yeah, same in Gutman, too. So we, uh, it was, and nobody had elected. So if, um, and I, I don't want to let any cats out of any bags, but if you're reading the tea leaves of, uh, the executive vice chancellor, I would bet dollars to donuts that most of us will be online um, in the fall. So hopefully students will get that information before the first day of classes so they have a little bit more of an idea. I could not assume, and I, I sort of tried to challenge everyone I know, <clears throat> don't assume that just because your students were in class with you at a specific time that they can now be home in class with you on a computer at a specific time. Um, and this really comes to something I wish I had learned much earlier. I'm ashamed that I, it took me so long to realize it, but students are whole people. They are not brains in chairs. So their living conditions are their learning conditions. So if uh, in the context of this semester, I had students, I did a lot of like evening hour Zooms because either students had caretaking responsibilities of their own children, or if they were in a house that had siblings, right? A lot of our students live at home with families. The, um, the New York City Department of Education requirements for synchronous online learning took precedence over the device and the bandwidth in the house if there was device and bandwidth in the house. So being really careful to design for flexibility. Um, I had sort of started uh, before this semester uh, with a choose your own adventure. Again, an idea I stole from somebody from a Canadian scholar on Twitter of, you know, there's 150 points worth of things you can do at some point in the semester. They're worth different amounts based on the amount of time I think they will take you. There's a design your own option. Do enough of these to get your points. Try, and I, I tried to make it really clear, start doing them now. I will take them on the last day of the class, but if you do them now while you're feeling well, hopefully, uh, you know, you give yourself a bit of, and that help with test anxiety. I also made all of my tests. So for us, we need some tests ish, uh, moving into on grading and self grading has been really helpful as well. Um, so students have to assess their learning that require and, th and then grade themselves. And then I'm just the person who puts it into blackboard. So I got to give a lot of really great emails this semester of like, it's okay. You haven't, whatever you've missed, you can catch up. Um, if when you're ready. So I had one student who I got to send a great email to. She was sick, her sister was sick. So she was really communicative, which a lot of students are not, um, particularly thinking about student populations. If we have a, a, a second, a, a first gen student population as, as Kingsborough has a very high one, um, they don't know necessarily that they can ask for extensions. There may be um, familial or personal things where they don't wanna ask. There may be things that they don't want to share with you. Um, so designing, um, I always assume that something horrible has happened to my students, which Cheryl said, this, this pedagogy of compassion or this pedagogy of care. And do I require my students to bleed for me or tell me that their sister who they thought they was, was getting better actually has died now? Um, I'm just trying to design to assume that 
all of these things are happening. Um, and then also having enough choice, right? So my, one of my favorite assignments is a meme, right? Meme something, um, really what Rhea had said about your assignments, like a 10 page research paper for people who are not academics, very unlikely that they will need to do that. Is that a skill that they need? Not really. What do they need and what can they build in my class that's better because a 10 page research paper requires skills, right? And if, you know, students need to learn those, they don't necessarily, no one's born knowing how to do that. So if we're going to take time learning how to do things, what's really useful? Writing cogent one to two pages, right? Using, uh, figuring out what sources are valid and how to evaluate that for yourself, figuring out how to make an evidence-based argument. So I've really tried to focus on what that is. I probably, um, this semester, I missed having any interaction with students. So if student, if we're online in the fall, I'm going to try and set up teams, team meetings, maybe once a week with each team during the times that were scheduled or were scheduled. And I'll let the teams choose different times if they can come up with other ones. So that's a little bit of what I'm doing. Thanks so much, Shauna. Rhea, can you tell us about your experience this semester and looking forward to the fall? Totally. Absolutely. I, um, I want to, uh, I think like I, I, I like how the comments that we are giving are from different disciplines and slightly different perspectives, but I think they're building together in this cool way, at least in my head. Um, so I really like that. Luke, if you don't mind, I did want to circle back to something like I wish I knew and I wish someone would have told me this. And it's just, I just want to flog that horse a little bit more. Um, don't take it personally when a student, if a student is caught plagiarizing or something, just like Cheryl said, it hurts my heart, but like, it's not about me. It's not about about us it's mostly about them right so just to remember that I am a I used to be a WAC fellow at SPS and like CUNY is the place that WAC and WID started so I just want to put a little plug in for those extremely useful uh, uh, pedagogic strategies and I think this is something that English people I think embrace maybe even the humanities people sorry Jana, sorry Peter uh, sort of embrace the idea of teaching the student to do the thing you want them to do in class right but I get into big arguments with like my economics uh, uh, colleague who feels like students can't write and this is a English problem I'm like, just, a, I'm not a grammar checker, man. If students can't write in your class, that's because you have not taught them the kind of writing that you expect them to do. And this is, I think, what Shana sort of stopped it at uh, just a minute ago. And I wanted to reiterate that. If you want students to do something, you know, Cheryl said, look for models in your teaching. I would add, say, like, extend that into give students models of the type of writing that you want them to do. Be kind to them. Understand that people don't automatically wake up in the morning knowing how to do things. Um, uh, and I wanted to come back to that student who, um, and I think this was the biggest thing for me. There are so many things to learn in those first, I think, two years or so of pedagogy. I think I have become a different type of person as a result of teaching than I used to be. Um, and I think it's worth to say that, uh, to expect that, right? I didn't know that teaching would actually change me as much as it did. I sort of sort of like a stuck up little snob. So I'm like, oh, whatever, I already know what I need to know. I'm in graduate school. But actually, I, uh, it, it has truly been a sort of humbling experience. And the most humbling thing was that I should not be mad at a student who just wants to pass the class. And I want to be clear about this. And something that Shauna said sort of struck, uh, that's why I wanted to get back to this. There are always going to be in CUNY students with serious big life issues that are stopping them from being A plus students, right? It's easy for me to sympathize with a student who is pregnant, a mother without a, so, a support system. My, some of my students work overnight and they come to an 8 a.m. poetry class and fall asleep. Oh, my heart weeps for them. But it's really easy for my heart to weep for them, right? But I think Shauna said it in this way, do I need my students to like bleed for me? And actually I want to sort of say that I, <laughs> Some students don't have a, some major issue or concern that you can peg your sympathy on, right? But, and I think it is harder to extend sympathy when there seems to be no reason for it, right? So when I see, you know, I'm sort of a crazy workaholic, and I think most graduate students and most academics are also, we have sort of a work-life balance issues, maybe more broadly speaking. But, you know, I still, and I still have trouble with students who are not fully invested in the class. And I, I, I just want to shout at them. I want to shake them and say, come on, try harder. You can do it. Look at the people who are suffering. They're trying. How come you're not trying? 
this is not some sort of weird moral like equation, right? I'm not here to deliver some sort of, uh, I don't know, testament on how much my students are struggling, right? The student who wants to get a C in the class and get out of there and get their 60 credits, uh, yeah, get their 60 credits and get out of community college because they just want a piece of paper that says they're capable, man, that person is as much my responsibility as the student who's struggling, the student who comes to cry to me, the student who shares their horrible family experience and so on. And I find it easy to be compassionate towards some people and harder to be compassionate towards others. And I just wanted us to uh, keep a check on that, right? Like my own um, sort of biases and my own working, horrible working habits have certainly contributed to some of the difficulty that it took me to come to this fairly simple insight. And then, um, the, what has changed, you know, I don't want to put a positive spin on something that we did in this like ad hoc move to online and it was a panicked rush and Gutman, I think just like Kingsboro, we did, we did have our spring break, but we only had that one week of pause and it was just, oh my God, my own feelings were all over the place. I had no idea what to do and still we did something. And, um, but I think what it did force me to do, and I think that we should prepare to be teaching online in the fall and maybe even in winter session, if anyone is teaching in January, um, uh, is to think about, think about like what, what does this achieve? Like every piece of class, right? If I want to give a short lecture, if I want to give an assignment, whatever, why on earth am I putting my students through pain and torture to do this? Because it is pain and torture to be online in a way that it is not uh, for most students to just come to campus and be in a class, right? It is an extra level of commitment. There's tech issues. There are like um, a lot of EDI issues uh, around all of this. I don't want to reiterate those right now, but I do want to say to take those as a, as a clarifying kind of um, uh, as a way to be clear, right? Um, what, what do I need to teach? What skill or what information do I want them to carry away from the class? And uh, generally, what do, what do my student, students need to know from my course to help them with the next one? And you might have to imagine what this will be. And so just to sort of wrap up the many ideas that are kind of swirling in my head. So I've tried to make a list. Shana said, living conditions are learning conditions. Man, oh my God, absolutely. 225%. And I know that's not mathematics possible but um, that is something to keep at the front and center of everything um, I found I made a couple uh, many missteps all over this uh, the last three months but um, I found that students actually want synchronous sessions um, I had thought I had immediately thrown off everything I was like async everything I'm teaching comp 2 and I'm teaching a, an English class on colonialism man everything I really want can be on email I had a perusal site so just like Cheryl I find students are have a lot of trouble re reading properly reading it with enough depth or even just having the are building up the energy to go reading, right? Um, I love reading, but I only like reading like books and mo movies and whatever. Like uh, I would encourage as an exercise for all of you guys to go and read something you don't like, such as I don't like reading instruction manuals or tech documents, right? Um, I don't like to read instructions of any sort, actually. Like, uh, you know, I, I, the only reason I can use WordPress is because you don't always need to read a lot of instructions. You can kind of figure it out a little bit, right? Try to read something you don't want to read, and I think you will replicate some of the um, experience that many of my students bring in into class. And so I use Perusal, and Perusal has worked pretty well for me. I think, Luke, I see you reaching towards the computer. Maybe you can help me out with that. Um, but I would say I would put a plug, put a plug for a synchronous recorded session. I don't know. I thought I would do everything async, and then my students were like, Professor, do you want us to show up at 10 in the morning? Do you want us to show up at 3 p.m.? And I really, you know, students hardly ever emailed to ask to come to class. This was kind of mind-blowing. In the middle of a pandemic, when all this crazy stuff was happening in the fourth week of March, students were wondering if I'm going to hold a sync session. So I would recommend recording everything, uh, maybe even like uh, having little notes, like this is what we talked about in the thing, you know, Blackboard lets you like annotate your recordings. Um, but don't throw away synchronous entirely. Please do not take attendance in the same way in your, ACE, in your online course as you would in your, uh, in your in person classes. Please reward participation in a different way. These things look different on, on the web than they do in person. Um, but they're important, right? Students want to be 
uh, want to get credit for what they're learning. And this, I think, goes back to what Cheryl, you were saying, and Shauna as well about the, like, gaming the course or about, like, having a, 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 some points for effort, right? Because a lot of these things are a lot of effort, and it's not fair to only grade on the final finished product as if the product is di divorced from the effort it took to get to that product, right? Um, and my last point is always be clear, be indexable. The way that I speak may not be the way that students understand something. So I might feel like I'm being so open and so whatever. Uh, and I, you know, like I thought my politics were as clear as day. Like I'm Indian, I'm teaching colonialism, and I talk about like institutional racism on a daily basis. I figured my students would know where I'm from, uh, where I'm coming from in these last two weeks. Uh, but actually, and all my colleagues are very similar. I have to say my colleagues are even more fiery and worked up about political issues in the US currently than I am. And, um, but our students came online and they said, we feel unsupported by faculty. Nobody, we feel like faculty doesn't care about us. And at, at first I was like, oh my God, my mind is exploding. How can you say that a CUNY faculty, you know, how can you say that CUNY faculty don't care about the issues in the city? I find our university as a whole is super committed and super progressive and super political in a way that I don't find other universities always are. It's kind of weird when you like go to conferences and stuff and the way we talk in CUNY is quite distinct from the way that people talk in many other English departments that I'm familiar with. And so it kind of boggled my mind, but then I realized it's not about me and what I'm saying, it's about how I'm being understood. And so it's like a basic, like, you know, English um, insight. What does your reader need to know? And in this case, what does your student need to understand? Well, how long does that email need to be where you say, students, I care about your lives. I understand that some of you are actually suffering from the, the like police brutality that I see around me, right? So stuff like that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance, I think. But what I realized in this last week and a half or so is that I was overcorrecting and sort of presenting myself in a way that's apolitical and unsympathetic, even though I, I'm not apolitical and I'm certainly sympathetic. So like, you know, complete that loop, you know, the assessment thing, like close the loop, like close the loop, you know, it's not about you to them. It's very much about them back to you. And this is, I think what Peter, you were saying about closing the loop assessments wise, but, but I think it's harder to close the loop as an instructor uh, online. So just remember that maybe a quick Google, you know, use a Google survey. Like it takes 15 minutes to build one, you know, three or four questions. How are you feeling today? What's the top thing on your mind? Just to check in, you know, and use them uh, like on a routine. So students expect them. So it's not just like one day you give one survey and never again. It's like maybe every week at the beginning of the week or every uh, fortnight you have a quick three or four question check in and students expect that they they will pre prepare for that, that and the class gets richer as a result of it. Thank you. Sorry, that was a bit long. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank Sorry. You. Um, so I, I want to invite attendees to I want to go for maybe five, 10 more minutes and invite attendees to put some, some uh, additional questions in the Q&A. There's a couple that um, I, I want to get to, but I, I do want to pull out um, a couple of, of themes that, that I'm hearing, and I think it's really important for attendees to take away. And, and one of them is, is, again, the need for flexibility, um, the need to be adaptive um, to a situation that continues to be fluid, continues to create all sorts of trauma, um, that not only are our students dealing with, but we're dealing with uh, as well as people in the city and, and around the city. Um, and to not expect that you're gonna get it right in your first semester teaching in this context, right? So um, a lot of, of comments about being generous and kind with your students around assessment and expectations and policy. We also wanna urge you to be generous and kind with yourself um, because you, Rhea's she's teaching for over a dozen years. She just laid out for us um, this kind of shifts in her assumptions over the past two months. Um, and there's, there's so much that, that we don't know. And you're actually going to get conflicting um, uh, feedback from your students. I got that with my own classes that I taught this semester. Some students wanted more guidance and more structure um, and, and more engagement. Others wanted less. And that's a really difficult um, balance to, to, to negotiate. Um, and um, I want to... Um, I think e each uh, panelist has also kind of either implicitly or explicitly talked about the value of 
of not being alone in this process of relying on colleagues and reflective practices in your, in your own teaching. Um, and that's one of the organizing principles of our work at the TLC and the Institute is to, to help graduate center students understand that they never have to negotiate their teaching um, no matter what context they're in alone, that there are people to talk through, um, to, get, to get ideas from, to bounce ideas off of, um, and to really seek those, um, those opportunities for companionship and collaboration out, okay? Um, I'm gonna pick a couple of questions um, here. Um, uh, uh, there's two questions about um, accessibility. Um, one is regarding the possibility that teaching is going to be online next fall. Um, can you please address how we can think about accessibility and how we can prepare um, ahead of time? Um, and the other is um, specific supports for, for students with, uh, with disabilities. Um, is there a panelist who wants to take on any of these questions? We'll go to Shauna. Um, I'll try and be as quick as I can um, in Chrome, very practically. So you want to alt text all of your images um, for students who are visually impaired. General like universal design for learning. Um, and this actually gets to management issues like universal design is not better for students with disabilities. It's just better. So you want multiple multiple modalities. You want every caption. Captions help your students who are hearing impaired or have hearing challenges, but they may also help your students who are um, English language learners, right? So this is a lot of work if you're going to be creating videos. So if there's something that's already done, go ahead and do that. I didn't do synchronous lectures because there's already a YouTube series of um, really nicely produced and captioned and alt texted and translated and subtitled um, for American government that I use. Um, finding things that are already high quality and mixing those up, that's how you manage the burden. Um, and then making sure that uh, you speak with students. Um, also, every campus should have an accessibility office or uh, reaching out to them because they can be a huge resource and seeing what people have already done. So it may be, and then also thinking about what resources and what tools you're requiring, you're requiring students. So we have, I use an open, an OER textbook that's available <clears throat> as a PDF, as an audiobook, um, and making sure that, you know, the scanned um, book chapter that you put on, that's not really accessible to screen readers unless you've OCR'd it. So making sure, um, but reach out to the office on your campus is really helpful. Thank you. Rhea, did you want to add something? Um, absolutely. I think uh, when I, at Gutman, we have, I can just say this, I, we have a high percentage of students with, um, with learning challenges. We're just a small school, and I think for many high school counselors, that me, uh, the small sort of translates that, like any student with an IEP, go to Gutman. Um, we don't actually have a lot of the resources that a bigger campus has, so this kind of presents kind of funny challenges. Um, but I want to uh, absolutely second uh, Shauna's suggestion of look up UDL, look up Universal Design for Learning, and uh, some of the if you haven't already. And um, uh, the principles are pretty simple, and they actually they help everybody, not just uh, the student who cannot hear well or the something right. So like most of my classroom, uh, ha classrooms have students with very mixed um, levels of achievement, whatever, on whatever metric, right? There's, they might have, um, some students are advanced readers, some are advanced writers, some are absolutely not, some are uh, English as a foreign language. Students from so many different backgrounds are in the same place. Um, at Gutman, maybe the only thing common in the students is that they are younger, right? We ask students to come full time in the first year, so they're just straight out of high school usually. Um, and I've written about some of this, so at the risk of sounding rather full of myself, if you Google me and, uh, uh, and like, I think it's called Teacher Voice. So it's like Banerjee Teacher Voice. It'll bring up the little piece that I wrote. And a strategy that I use a lot is, I call it like the do more. And um, especially with low stakes assignments, I, I, just, I just ask students, so excuse me, let's say the, the assignment is to write a journal summarizing the reading in one paragraph and analyzing the reading in one paragraph, right? A really straightforward English um, intro level assignment, right? Um, well, for some of my students, just the chat, it is challenging enough to read something and write a summary and then to write an analysis, right? So it's usually like enough, but there are students in my class who are, who 
who are more advanced, right? And uh, they get bored in my class or they think the class is stupid because like, oh God, I, why do I have to take this comp one? I've already done like AP English or something, right? Um, or comp two, two is another whole challenge. Um, and so with the do more, all it is is it's an extra line on the prompt that's like in italics or something. It says, do more, you can read this book or, or read, this, read this poem or watch this movie and you can like build it into your response. It's nothing very intrusive. It's just a very, very simple um, kind of a, an, uh, uh, how should I say it? It's like an invitation to a student rather than a challenge, right? Like, here you go. If you feel like it, if you have the time, you can do it. I will say that in my experience, this do more thing, some semesters, not a single one of my 90 plus students will do the do more, right? Um, but I sort of, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a stubborn person. So I just keep putting it on my assignments where, uh, where the opportunity presents itself. And sometimes students will, even a student who hasn't said a word all semester. Um, and it's like a little like present in the grading. You know, I hate grading. Grading's like the worst uh, for me. Um, but when a student has run off and done some extra work and put that into their class, it's like, Man, it makes the heart glow, you know? Thank you, Rio. Um, Cheryl's gonna answer a question um, about um, incorporating synchronous and asynchronous element uh, into courses and how you go about making that decision. Well, I mean, I'm, probably others might add, uh, add to this, but I wanted to say, I mean, I think uh, Shauna's comment about choose your own adventure, that really is like, you know, the important part of it and it gets it, it connects for me to what Ria said as well about um, students want the, the synchronous sessions you know they some of them really do want that and so don't take attendance but I, my approach with those has been to you know just give us a chance to talk about something kind of loosely and informally they want to connect but also I tend to tie it up with Peter's comment about all learning is social so we will do something very concrete in that session. <clears throat> so maybe I'll have assigned a, a couple discussion questions that they're supposed to answer. And I'll say, okay, in the online session, if you want to join us, we're going to answer the first two of the discussion questions together. So they leave that session having completed their homework, right? Um, and they've completed it together. And it doesn't matter. They'll all turn in the same answer because we will have constructed it cooperatively and socially in that session. They leave with a very concrete outcome. They have completed their homework, so and they've gotten the sort of social connection. So I've started offering um, sessions like that with very, we're gonna do this work that you have to do anyway. So you get to get that done, you get to connect with us, you get to do it socially. Um, so I've done little things like that. Um, and then again, I think the choose your own adventure approach is really important. I started doing that in my you know, regular face-to-face -face classes to an extent. And it was so great for me because instead of everyone turning in an analysis, a literary analysis paper on the same date, you know, they could choose one of three or one of five options throughout the semester. Pick the one that works for you schedule wise in terms of you have time to do it at that point. You want to wait till the end of the semester because you feel like you need more practice and you're nervous about that paper or maybe, you know, you want to do it because the topic of that particular option, option three really appeals to you. Um, so choose your own adventure and it was great for me because I wasn't getting 30 papers on the same day so I could spend more time with the six so I you know I think that be really flexible give lots of options and for the synchronous sessions do them whoever shows up um, shows up that's fine and um, maybe offer different options and try to think of maybe offering some, it's worked for, for me, that the students will um, be able to complete an assignment that they're working on or make progress toward an assignment that they're working on um, with you and with their classmates. And it really creates this social opportunity and it just saves them time, right? They're like, oh, I'm gonna do that because I'll get that work done and I don't have to worry about writing that paper at 6, 6 a.m. the morning that it's due because we're gonna be working on it together um, and getting a head start or I don't know how to start so I'll you know hang in on that session and we'll we'll do it together. So I've tried to do more um, sort of live I, I, live homework sessions in a way where we're doing homework together. Thank you, Cheryl. That that sets up this next question really really well. This is from uh, Olivia in the chat. She's interested in hearing more about social learning and how to get students working together under the current circumstances where classroom 
space and campus space are, are no longer accessible to students? How can we get best get students collaborating with each other in an online setting um, where each student's living um, and learning conditions are, are different? Is there anyone who wants to respond to that? Peter. Uh, yeah, so in the Blackboard Collaborate app, there's a breakout session option and you can have Blackboard kind of random during, so this is kind of, this is assuming that you're running synchronous meetings. So I do, I'm doing a mixture of the two. I kind of, I don't do, we started at the beginning of the whole thing in March and we were encouraged to like, all right, just let's make it just like class and we'll go on and we'll do like a hundred minute live Zoom lectures. And that soon became, I, don't, I couldn't do it anyway. It just, it was, I, it was like, just talking to a screen for a hundred minutes and any questions and then you'd hear the uh, feedback and like Shh, no and then you just keep going so i stopped it we stopped doing that and now we have a mix of like asynchronous stuff like videos and uh online homework and then try that and then we'll meet and we'll talk about it and when we meet there'll be a problem like for for me anyway there's a couple problems three two or three problems that we're all going to work on together and then to make the group smaller put them in breakout sessions on blackboard collaborate and then as the instructor we can go in and chat or see them talk with them in their breakout sessions how's it going what do you think about this problem what do you what uh what do you think How, how's it going do you have any questions things like that so there's that option in blackboard collaborate ultra the breakout sessions i think zoom has it too and all the other other meeting apps. And then another thing that I've, that I had used in the past and I think I'm going to, that I'm going to use again, that seemed to work for, you know, socializing kind of asynchronous socializing is, and that is Facebook groups. And I know Facebook is, uh, you know, I'm not thrilled to use Facebook, but it seems that lots of students already have Facebook, you know, for better or for worse. And it, it's instead of having them go to a different space or having them get another account for a, an app that they don't actually currently have, use the Facebook, the fact that they all use Facebook already, or at least have a Facebook account, they go into a Facebook group that's dedicated to the course. And I'll post uh, up either, most, most of the time, I just post a problem and ask, you know, can someone, yeah, someone, you know, take a screenshot of your solution and let's let's talk about it and then i give them you know some sort of credit for just posting anything even if it's you know totally wrong it's great just to have something to talk about discuss these the math problems so that's what i that's what i'll be using to, later today <laughs> so, uh at two i have my first synchronous live zoom meeting i'm going to introduce the course uh, we'll probably look at one math problem to see where the, where they're at, and then what their one of their homework assignments is to join the Facebook group. Although that's optional, I can't really require them to do it. Lots of them do though. And then once word gets out that oh yeah, this is kind of useful, and I don't always have to be there as the instructor. The students are answering their own questions and things like that. It's the other nice thing about the Facebook group. Like at like two a.m. when I'm definitely asleep, I hope uh, they can still have questions, and some of them will be up and they can you know, talk about problems or questions they have about the course or the content. So that's uh, two options that I'm gonna use. Thank you, Peter. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come in um, uh, just about uh, specific approaches, especially in composition classes. Um, and I think these you know, challenges around how you help students read your material are uh, adaptable to different disciplines, um, as well as um, specific, um, there's a specific question about um, uh, what was reading practices and the other comp question. Yeah, they're actually both about reading practices. So Cheryl, do you want to, do you want to speak to that? Um, how specifically you help students approach a text? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so couple things uh, with the online teaching I've found that um, 
I will offer sessions where students will come and I will read to them from the text that we're reading, just like being read to, and then we'll talk about it. Um, I've also actually just started listening to some books I might want to read, uh, teach next year, you know, on, I, I'm not a person who listens to texts. I don't do like the audio version of text, but I signed up at my local library system and I've been downloading. I'm currently listening to Song of Solomon read by Toni Morrison. So it's kind of cool to think about, maybe I'll have live sessions where we'll listen to her together and then talk about it. So <clears throat> being read to is actually a very helpful way for students to absorb reading and learn reading. Read to them and then talk about what you're reading. Um, and people like to be read to. But more specifically, I do a lot of annotation assignments. Um, I guess you're doing social annotation right now, right with your um, the teacher CUNY handbook or something. So I do social annotation using Hypothesis where they're annotating text online. Um, and then I will, may or may not join into those conversations. I give them guidance for annotation. I talk a lot about what it means to annotate a text as they're reading. Um, and I do it in very sort of, when we have face-to-face sesh, -face sessions, I'll do it in, you know, very kind of analog ways where I'll write a portion of a text that maybe has a metaphor in it. And we're talking, you know, we're learning about how to think about um, connotation and metaphor in, in readings and how to interpret them. And I will, They'll work in groups with a certain color marker and they'll start annotating it and then they'll pass it to the next group and the next group with another color marker will answer a different question or also annotate it. So we will, you know, you can socially annotate uh, text together in many ways. And so I talk about annotation. I give hands out, handouts about why we annotate, what kinds of things we might annotate. I get, I narrow the expectation for them on annotation. I won't, ex you know, I'll say when you're reading this next chapter of this book or when you're reading these poems by this really look for the use of color, you know, something really specific. So they're not trying to figure out what does all this mean? They have a very specific way into thinking about the text um, is often really, really helpful. Um, let's just think about this character in this next chapter and really just read about, uh, as you're reading, annotate interesting things you're learning about this one character. Um, I think students find that helpful, you know, to kind of narrow their reading in that way. They find it helpful to practice annotation for different purposes and in different ways. Um, social annotation platforms, I'm all about hypothesis. I use it a lot, um, but I've learned to not just put it out there and say, everybody annotate this text. It can get very busy in the margins. So I will have groups, you know, and you sign up for different texts to annotate. Not everybody's an responsible for annotating this text or, you know, different you know angles on annotation so I just I have found that um, thinking about annotation really helps and in a comp class the le less is more absolutely with reading I don't assign a lot of reading I just assign the really juicy good stuff <laughs> you know I don't ask them to read a lot in a comp tech in a comp class now that doesn't mean I might not in the end teach a novel sometimes part of choose your own adventure is at the beginning of the semester, I'll ask students what they wanna read. I'll give them some options. We'll talk about different options. We'll maybe read short pieces by three different authors and then say, which author do you wanna hear more from? And you know, it, it, it'll depend, but you know, I think you have to do what works for you, what works for the students. Um, don't ask them to do a lot of research in a comp class, my suggestion and uh, keep the reading um, the reading load light or, or something that they're really, really interested in. And if you do end up teaching a longer text, spend a lot of time with it. Go through it slowly and talk about it as you're going. Don't have them read it in a week and then come having read the whole thing. That's what I would do. Break it up. Thank you. So um, we'll, we'll take one more question. I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. Um, Rhea and Shauna and Cheryl and Peter have given us so much to think about and to think with today. Um, so this, this last question was specifically about um, academic integrity in online instruction and how you have approached that um, and how you've seen your colleagues uh, approach that um, this past semester and, and as you're going forward. Uh, and we'll ask Rhea to respond to this one. Thanks, Luke. Cheryl, thank you also for the thing about comp. You know, as a person who most of my life is teaching comp, I would say, same like you, you know, maybe, uh, People are interested in a novel, right? A short novel, I would say, uh, and a couple of shorter pieces. That's like plenty for a comp class. Um, and it ties in with what I want to say about plagiarism or, um, 
or cheating, right? I think the word was uh, in the question was that. And I want to say, like, again, go back to the what you want students to or why you want students to do something in a class. Right. So I think Cheryl said about like uh, uh, coming together and doing homework. Right. Um, I used to do this and where all the answers are the same and everyone turns in the same piece. Well, technically, one person could have written all the answers and everybody else. gets it, Right. So there are those kind of um, things. But I would say. Uh, I don't know, go easy on the students, right? I think most people, like once you are, uh, once you have talked about plagiarism a little bit in the first uh, couple of weeks of the class, I think that um, students are very aware coming in from New York City public high schools, like what cheating is, what plagiarism is. Um, and when someone chooses to plagiarize, I don't think it's because they're like jerks or they're purposely like horrible, evil, beings right it's like they are stressed and worried and they want to get a good grade but there are like insurmountable pressures on them and so i would say design an assignment that really specifically addresses what you want to teach so like if you give a you know write a paper about i don't know nella larson's passing at the end of a comp class well you could that is a thing that people do but if it's like write a paper then it's very easy to cheat and also the the temptation is there because like i don't know man like i don't i just want to get this assignment done right i just want to like get something off the internet cobble it together and put it into uh, and submit it for a grade right but um if you're asking questions that are more maybe like tied to a student's response to a certain passage right or a student trying to figure out a certain type of character analysis if your questions are more specific then firstly it's harder to google it and just find the answer but secondly just googling may not be the problem right it might be that the learning part the critical thinking analysis part of your assignment is not in not uh, restricted to the what is the name of a character uh, like what year was the book written or like a certain keywords right it could be that the analysis or the thinking you want students to do is actually like Googling all the stupid stuff and then using that to think about how that applies to their situations in some broader type of way, right? So think about what you want your assignment to do and what you want your final exam or your final whatever uh, culminating sort of course experience to achieve and, and tailor the questions in that way. Thank you, Ria. And thank you to Shauna and, and Cheryl and Peter as well for your fantastic contributions and reflections. Um, I'm positive that these ideas will resonate into our seminars tomorrow and through the remainder of the Institute. Um, I've un tried to unmute several of you so that we could say a big collective thank you. It's not gonna work the way that I dreamed it would, but anyone who <laughs> is able to unmute, please shout a thank you to our, our panelists today. Um, and thank also- <laughs> thank you thank you yeah, that was awesome and and rest assured that um although shauna ria and cheryl and peter are exceptional um there are lots of faculty who will talk to you about uh, their teaching and their experiences on your campus um, and they'll be there waiting for you this fall uh, and willing to help you in any way that they can okay so be well everybody thank you again to our panelists and, thank you guys um and we'll see you all very soon Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.